When burdens come so hard to bear, and no words we drink and share, you drive away the smiles in me, my heart in pain. Then my Lord from heaven above speaks to me in tones of love. He wipes away the tears and pain, speaks out again. I need no mansion here below. Jesus said that I could go to a home beyond the cloud. I made my hands. Oh, won't you come and go along? We will sing the sweetest song. Never play the poem of one's glory man. Oh, won't you come and go along? We will sing the sweetest song. Never play the poem of one's glory man. Oh, the thought to me is sweet, and I love. At the ending of my journey here below, seems I hear the voices play in a world without a name. I won't worry when the time shall come to go. I need no mansion here below, for Jesus said. chapter 
as we look at some of the things that uh, we're looking at in this, uh, in this particular chapter. Now, recognize once again who Philip is. Philip is, is an evangelist. Philip is a, is a deacon. Philip is a minister. Philip is a minister of God's word. Philip is, uh, is a man that God uses to preach the gospel. He, is, uh, he was uh, uh, set to be one of those that was a servant in the church. And the reality is that when the persecution began, he went out from where he was. He went out from Jerusalem. He went to where the Spirit of God was leading him to go. Now, you know, the reality is that we all always follow the leading of the Lord. As we feel the presence of the Lord, as He guides us, as we, whether we're at work or whether we're out in a grocery store or wherever we might be, God may lead us to speak to someone in some manner or some way that they need, that we don't know anything at all about. But God knows what's going on in their life, and He knows what the need is that's there. And so the opportunity may come that we are able to somehow be a witness. Now, I read online this week where Brother Lester was talking about it, and he said something to the impact of saying that uh, when he was uh, uh, talking about that, he wanted his life to always be a witness. Even if he didn't open his mouth, he wanted his life to be a witness. And I agree with that. I think that our life should always be a witness. And the way that we live, it ought to be a witness. And the way that we talk, it ought to be a witness. And, uh, and whatever there is about our life, it ought to reflect Christ in such a way that people would see and they would desire what we have. And uh, so, you know, when we look at this and we look at what was going on with Philip, we recognize that he had just been in a great revival, okay? He had been to a town and everybody in the town was paying attention to what he had to say. He had been to a town where many people had trusted Jesus as Savior, where he had had a huge baptism service, where they had confessed Christ as Savior where revival occurred so much that the sound got back to Jerusalem and Jerusalem sent down two of the apostles to look into it and see what was going on and to help with the effort that was there. So it was a huge thing. And now we come to a scripture where Philip leaves where a brand new church is started, where God has blessed in a marvelous way where the Spirit of God says, head down that road toward the desert. Didn't tell him why he was going. Didn't tell him what was going to happen when he got there. Didn't tell him anything about it, but he led him to make that journey. And when he got down there, he talked to one person. Wasn't a whole village, wasn't a whole city, wasn't a big crowd, one person. Because, you see, God cares about you as an individual. You're important to Him. You are so important to Him that if you were the only one who would ever trust Jesus as Savior, Jesus would have died for you. That's how important you are. It matters to you. You are significant to God. He proved it this situation and that's a very significant thing now let me just talk about this just a little bit about what we're talking about he went down toward Gazer guys and guys however you say that particular word and a man of Ethiopia now what kind of situation is that we have Philip who is a well you know he's got a Greek name so he's probably uh, his family probably came from outside of Jerusalem, into Jerusalem, and in the situation he was in. But still, he's a Jewish individual. He's a, he's a Greek Jew. He's one who has, uh, in, in, uh, you know, he's, he's probably uh, uh, been in other areas, but to go and to speak with, he went down to Samaria already, talking to people who were not of, of the Jewish persuasion in the sense of the word. And now he's talking to one who was a proselyte who had 
come to Jerusalem to worship, but he wasn't from Jerusalem. And, uh, and it says plainly that he was an Ethiopian. Okay? He's a foreigner. Now, you know, a lot of times it isn't the easiest thing in the world for us when someone is a little bit different from us to approach that person. If they are from a foreign country, they speak a different language than we do, and they look a little different or whatever, sometimes we are hesitant. But God says they're important to him. God says he cares about them. God says there isn't anyone that he's willing to see die lost. You see, he cares. He cares about those that we may look at him with strange eyes. We look at those that have a strange religion and live in faraway places and wear clothing that doesn't look quite like we do. And he cares about them. And he cares about where they are in relationship to him. And they matter to him. And so they ought to matter to us because we belong to him. And we are part of the family of God. And that person when they accept Christ as Savior is a part of that same family. So they are our brother or our sister in the Lord and we ought to love them and care about them and so when we look at these verses of scripture and we come to this particular place and we find this individual and as we look at this individual we we think well you know God you took him away from this big huge crowd where there was lots of people listening and you took him to this one person but how important is that person well, obviously to God, he's important. But I ask you a question. Did this person that Philip talked to go down the road a little ways and die, or did he just go to heaven right immediately, right after he got saved and he got baptized? Well, no, he didn't. The reality is that he made his way back home, okay? He went back to Ethiopia. And in going back to Ethiopia, there are some things that we know from history. Not that we know him. Anybody know his name? Anybody find his name anywhere written there in the Bible? Say anything about who he is? Just says he's a eunuch who is kind of high up in authority with Candace. Now, Candace is a nice name. I've known a few people named Candace. But the reality is that this isn't a name. This is a... This is a uh, slight like Pharaoh, okay? It's the name of the office that she has. She's the queen, and they call her Candace, just like Pharaoh was the king, and they called him Pharaoh, okay? That's, that's kind of the situation with this. And, and uh, so, uh, but he's, he's kind of high up in that situation. But, you know, when you go through history and you look at religious history, Christian history, Okay. you find that Ethiopia was a place where there was a powerful influence for Christianity. And there are ancient documents, biblical documents, that have been discovered and found in Ethiopia. You see, obviously, God used this man make a difference where he went. And that is a very significant thing. You see, God takes normal, regular people, and he uses them in extraordinary ways. And we don't have to know their name because what they're about spreading the news about Jesus. And it's Jesus that matters. It is who he is that matters. It is the gospel message that matters. It doesn't matter in reality if anybody who ever watches a video ever learns what my name is on. 
has no difference whatsoever. But it does matter whether they learn about Jesus, whether they learn about what he did, whether they find a direction to get to the cross, where they learn about salvation. That's what matters. Now it's interesting when we began to look at this because uh, God knew that this person was going to be there. The Spirit moved Philip in that direction. He came. He heard him reading. Obviously, he was reading in a language that was understandable. I was reading in one of the commentaries that said he was probably reading in Greek, so he was reading the Septuagint, which Philip understood quite well because that was already uh, a translation that had taken place 100 and some, 200 years before, somewhere along in there. And, and it was very available, and the manner in which uh, this translation translates this looks like it came from the Septuagint in that kind of way. And that may be true. I don't know about that circumstance or situation, but uh, I do know that it was the Word of God, and the Word of God coming from the book of Isaiah, and it's very easy to figure out where it came from. It came from Isaiah 53. Now, you all probably know a little bit about Isaiah 53, but Isaiah 53, the verses that we're talking about uh, are verses... Uh, 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 verse 7 and 8, it says, He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He has brought us a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. Then thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And so all of those things come from a chapter that is well recognized as a chapter that speaks of the Messiah. But not just the Messiah, the suffering Messiah, because it begins in that manner. Who shall believe our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form of comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him smitten, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so he asked him, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? Unless somebody tells me. Well, I thank God that somewhere along the line, God has given teachers and instructors and, and, and people who do understand. I thank God when he gives us understanding, when we read and we look into it and we study it out and we figure out what it's talking about. I thank God that he gave us prophecies that tell us about Jesus so clearly that when Philip heard this man reading this scripture, he began at that very verse and preached to him Jesus. He told him all about what Jesus did and what he came to do and what it was about. He made him aware that all of us are sinners within need of a Savior and that Jesus came to be that Savior, that he came to die on the cross, that he came to be a sacrifice, that he came to give his life. And in that, he told him about these things, that he was taken from prison and judgment and nobody declared, nobody was defended, nobody stood up for him, nobody did anything, but he kept his mouth shut. He did not defend himself. He allowed them to do what it was that they did. And he went to the cross willingly, and he died on that cross for us. But 
it makes it plain that he, when he went to the grave, when making uh, the grave with the rich and those that were, well, all of those things that it says about that with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. And, and then he comes to the verse that says, but it says, he shall prolong his days, that he would live again, that resurrection would occur, that life would come again, that he would live to be the Savior. So he preached to him about Jesus from the time he was born to the time that he died to the time he rose again from the dead. And he gave the full message, the full gospel message. And the man sitting there in his chariot as they were riding along and reading and talking about the Lord. And they came to a place where there was a lot of water. And he says to him, he says, what doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip answered him, he opened his mouth and he answered him and he said this in, in verse 37. If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came to faith in that few minutes. A faith that transformed into being a witness. Into being having a life having eternal life. Someday we'll get to meet this guy. And boy, won't it be something to be able to talk with him about how God changed his life that day in a desert pathway going back home to Ethiopia when Philip came along. So he went down into the water and they baptized him. And he came up out of the water and he looked around and Philip was gone. Where the world did he go? No, he didn't even pay any attention to it because he was shouting for joy because God had just changed his life. He had found the Savior. And the Bible says that the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in the Zotus. Now, I don't know how he got there. The Lord knows. But I do know one thing. He continually listened to the Lord and did what God led him to do. He led him to win souls. He went to Samaria where nobody else wanted to go. And he preached the gospel and souls were saved. He went running down into the desert when God led him that way. And he met one guy. And he led him to Jesus. You know, it's a wonderful thing when you see what God does when he moves in people's lives. He moves in our life too. He desires to lead us and help us to be the witness too, to show others the way to teach them about Jesus. Interesting, he had a scroll. You know, I've, I've got this Bible. Uh, not a very expensive Bible. I've got another one at home just like it. Every page, same number, same everything on it. Cost about five times as much as this one did. I like this one better because when I open it, it just kind of falls open where I can read it real good. But I love, I love my Bible. I love the Bible that I told you all about that I went down to the dollar store and paid a dollar for. Because it, I love the words. Because I know they're God's words. And I know they change lives. Because faith comes by hearing hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing none of the, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God means something. Whether it's an expensive scroll like he had 
or it's a dollar Bible. It means something because it impacts lives. So learn it. Let it be a part of you. Hide it in your heart. And let God bring it to your memory when you need it. When you're talking to a friend. He does that, you know. Sometimes scripture, if you don't even remember, you remember. He does it. And he'll bring it to your thoughts. God took a church content and satisfied and he spread them out all across the known world. So the gospel message could go where it needed to go to people who needed to hear it. So from just this chapter we go from where they were preaching in Jerusalem and Judea to going into Samaria to preach and then touching lives all the way down hundreds of miles away in Ethiopia with the gospel message. And souls were the result. It's a beautiful thing. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, the words of Isaiah 53 can impact your life. And the words of Acts 8 can help you to see that it talks about Jesus. If you don't know him, you need him as your Savior. Let him come in today. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you once again. And Lord, we just ask that you let this word go forth and accomplish your purpose in sending it. And that lives may be changed as a result. 